The list of accidents and near misses around nuclear weapons do not make for peaceful bedtime reading. Eric Schlosser, author of Fast Food Nation, documents these in exhaustive and frightening detail in his book, Command and Control, Nuclear Weapons, the Damascus Accident, and the Illusion of Safety. Schlotzer sat down with NMIF producer Megan Kamerick to talk about our brushes with disaster and where the biggest threat will come from in the future. Eric Schlosser, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks on for having me. Focus. So I came of age in the 1980s when the Cold War was getting a little bit hotter and I had nightmares about nuclear annihilation. I haven't had those in years, but after reading parts of your book, um, I think that's because I haven't been paying attention. So, are I'm we sorry. less safe now than we were then? Should I be just as terrified? Uh, the danger never went away. Mm. But the risk of an all-out nuclear war was far greater during the Cold War. Unfortunately, there are very bright people, much brighter than myself, who are nuclear weapons experts, who think that the risk of a single weapon detonating is probably greater today mm. than it was during the Cold War. And that has to do with the spread of nuclear weapons and in some ways, uh, not as careful management as there should be. We'll talk about the incident in Damascus, Arkansas. In, 19, in 1980, I think, yeah. a Titan II missile was damaged by a falling tool. It pierced the skin, it caused a propellant leak. The complex ended up being destroyed. We did not have a giant nuclear incident. Yeah. Why did you structure the book around that particular incident? After I finished writing Fast Food Nation, I was spending time in Colorado Springs with the Air Force, where they have some of their top secret installations, it's where their U.S. Space Command, Air Force Space Command were headquartered at the time. And I was there to talk to them about the future of warfare in space, but I became more and more interested in nuclear weapons, because many of these officers had served as launch officers in ballistic missile underground control centers. And one of them told me the story of this extraordinary accident in Damascus, at Arkansas, involving this missile and its warhead. The most sophisticated thing we had built, really, well, to be a weapon. Well, what it was is it's the most powerful nuclear warhead we ever put on a missile. And that one warhead was three times more powerful than all the bombs used by all the militaries in the Second World War including both atomic bombs. This was a nine megaton warhead. And the reason that the, the, the accident and the story of the accident was fascinating on so many levels, a, a relatively trivial event, a dropped socket in the silo, set it in motion. There was extraordinary personal courage and heroism that night for hours as the Air Force tried to figure out what to do, how to save the missile, how to prevent a nuclear catastrophe. But also, that one accident and how it unfolded illustrated for me some much more important themes of the book. And one of those, one of those themes is the difficulty of controlling complex technological systems. And you know, we seem to be much better at making them than we are at controlling them. And in this accident, once the skin of the missile is pierced, thousands of gallons of highly flammable, highly explosive rocket fuel are filling the silo, the Air Force doesn't know what to do. And they don't know what to do because nothing like it had ever happened before. This missile system had been on alert for about 17 years. So and this was a falling socket. Let's just keep this in mind, a socket. A right? worker was on a, a steel work platform, dropped the socket. It bounced on the platform. He reached for it almost caught it, and then it fell through a very narrow gap between the work platform and the missile. It took a one in a million bounce, hit the missile, and pierced the skin. And in talking to other, this was a Titan II missile, in talking to other Titan II missile repairmen, many of them I interviewed for the book, they said tools fell in the silo all the time. There was never a problem. You'd have to go all the way down to the bottom of the silo, get the tool, go back up. They said that if you sat on that work platform and threw a socket a thousand times deliberately trying to hit the missile, you wouldn't be able to do it. So it was really a freak accident. But you find again and again and again with these nuclear weapon accidents that could have been very, very bad 
that a very simple, innocuous thing often sets them in motion. Well, this is what's so striking about the book. You, there are more than a thousand nuclear weapons involved in significant accidents right. or incidents just between like 1950 and 1968, That's I right. believe. Many of these could have been devastating. Right. So does the fact that human intervention or technology or in some cases just dumb luck averted this, does that mean the system worked? Well, you can, you can look at it two ways. The system's worked thus far. And it's a testament to the extraordinary technical competence of our weapons laboratories, including Sandia, which is here in Albuquerque. And I write at length about engineers at Sandia and their efforts to make nuclear weapons safe. It's a testament to the administrative skills of the military in keeping control of these weapons. It's a testament to the personal courage again and again of ordinary servicemen and enlisted personnel who risked their lives and sometimes lost them in order to prevent one of these catastrophes. But nuclear weapon safety isn't, um, you know, it's not like being a, a, a ball player. If you're a ball player and you're out at the plate 70% of the time, your 30% success rate gives you a 300 batting average and you're going to be an all-star. In nuclear weapon safety, you can have perfect custody and safe custody of your weapons every single day, and then one day you don't, and all those other days don't really matter. You know, I'm struck by what you're saying. There's a terrible story about right after the war in Los Alamos about a man who had helped build the Trinity yeah. bomb, showing someone putting a beryllium sphere, I think, over yeah. a core, yeah. and there's a mistake. Yeah. Very easy mistake. Something slips. Yeah. And this was Louis Sloten, yes. who was one of the Manhattan Project scientists who assembled the nuclear core for the first test of a nuclear device at Alamogordo. He, a chain reaction starts and he slams down, he basically contains it, but gets a fatal dose of radiation. And he, he had a screwdriver and he was slowly lowering this hemisphere, two hemispheres of a nuclear core, to demonstrate how you could start a chain reaction and the hemisphere fell off the screwdriver, it closed, it went super critical. And in that case, he was able to then quickly disassemble this assembly and save the lives of the other people in the room. And I write about it because he was the safety device. That's what they and said in their report. Yeah, he's the one who saved the lives of the other people. And he was a, he was a brilliant young man and his death through radiation poisoning was captured on film mm. at his request and then shown to class after class of military and civilian people who had to handle nuclear weapons as a lesson in what happens to you if you make a mistake. You know, that's astounding considering, you know, the documentary I saw when I was in college in the 80s called Atomic Cafe that shows you all the propaganda films in the 50s. Yeah with a duck and cover and like, they knew what these bombs would do. Yeah. <laughs> Hiding under your desk was not going to stop that. Yeah. I, there was an incident in 1961 in the book. It's one of the most intense moments in the Cold War. American and Soviet tanks are facing each other at Checkpoint Charlie. And about a month later, I believe, a Strategic Air Command in Nebraska loses contact with um, a ballistic missile early warning system in Greenland. Yeah. So they call NORAD in Colorado to see what's going on. Well, they can't get through either. They assume there's been an attack. They scramble hundreds of planes all over the world yeah. to get ready to go until a B-52 alerts someone like, oh no, we've been in contact with the base in Greenland. Everything's okay. Yeah. How, we came close to a nuclear war. How unusual was that? Well, that was the Black Forest incident. Oh, right. And I and forgot to say it was because of one switch yeah. by AT&T in Colorado that went out and yeah. there wasn't and there was a redundant no, system. No redundancy. It's amazing. You know, the, the command and control system is extraordinarily complex because it has to provide the President of the United States the ability to authorize a nuclear strike in retaliation very quickly. Uh, during the Cold War, if the Soviet Union had launched missiles from the Soviet Union, they'd take about a half hour to reach the United States. If they launched from their submarines off the coast, they could hit Washington, D.C. in 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. So the decision-making time, once you thought you were under attack, 
was extraordinarily brief. And one of the other remarkable incidents occurred in 1980 at a period, again, of high international tension. The Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. We had just um, said that we were going to boycott the Olympics. And uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, President Carter's national security advisor, got a telephone call in the, middle to, in the middle of the night from his military aide, General William Odom. And it woke up Brzezinski, and General Odom said, 220 Soviet missiles are on their way to the United States. And Brzezinski said, I want you to check that out. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and call me back. And Odom called him back in the middle of the night and said, I have a correction. It's actually 2,200 missiles heading towards the United States. And Brzezinski told him to check again, and Brzezinski prepared to call Carter and discuss our retaliatory options. And as Brzezinski was there at night, his wife was asleep beside him, and he decided not to wake her in case Washington was about to be incinerated. She would never know. William Odom called back, said, sorry, false alarm, and it was later traced back to a defective computer chip at NORAD that was sending out an erroneous signal that we were under attack. Now, it never got to the point of Carter actually deliberating whether to retaliate or not, but again and again there are these close calls. And you can say the system worked, and in one sense it did, but it almost didn't. And there's no guarantee it will continue to work flawlessly. Um, one thing you bring up uh, is that another of these incidents, God, there are so many, <laughs> It's kind of terrifying that uh, Norway launched a, an experimental missile in 1995 yeah. to study the Northern Lights. Had told Russia ahead of time, weeks ahead of time, but whatever the memo didn't reach, Boris Yeltsin, he gets his football, gets the launch codes, and is ready to fire off and thinking it's a U.S. attack. And yeah. that doesn't happen. But you exhaustively document these from the U.S. side. Yeah. What do we know about what happened in the Soviet Union and Russia during this time? Well, I, I very much deliberately focused on the management of the American arsenal because I was able to use Freedom of Information, Freedom of Information Act requests and interview former weapons designers, former bomber crew members, launch crew members, people who had been nuclear weapon repairmen. And I don't speak Russian, and I had no access to Russian archival sources. But as critical as I am in many cases of the management of our arsenal, I think that we probably have done a better job than anyone in the world. We invented this technology. We probably have the best safety mechanisms of anyone. And if you look at Russia and you look at you know, how they manage their nuclear processing facilities, there were clearly huge explosions. There was huge contamination with uh, plutonium and other radioactive elements as they were processing fissile material. And they have a history of fires on their nuclear weapons submarines. There was a serious fire on a nuclear weapons submarine just two years ago mm. that was loaded with, I think, 16 missiles with four, head, four warheads each. So I'm hoping someone there writes this book. Uh, at it's the a end of the book, it's more dangerous there to do yeah. that. <laughs> well, this is information that's important. And, and at the end of the book, I look at the rate of industrial accidents in other countries as a rough measure of those nations' ability to manage complex technological systems. And India, Pakistan, Russia, uh, these are countries that we should be concerned about the management of their nuclear weapons. Talk about that. Where does the risk lie today? Is it I South think the Asia? Greatest, I think the greatest risk lies in South Asia. One of the most disturbing things that came out of Edward Snowden's revelations that he got through the NSA, I mean, for a, an investigative journalist, the notion that your email's being read and your cell phone may be tapped, you know, that's not that remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to see that it's true, but you just assume it could be true. But what was really disturbing to me from the Snowden revelations were uh, the documents he found saying that our intelligence community really doesn't know how Pakistan is storing its nuclear weapons, how they move and transport them, how they're managing them, and there is an area where you not only have, I think, a high risk of the theft of a weapon by extremists, either within the Pakistani military 
or extremists who've shown themselves very good at attacking Pakistan's military bases. But you also have a situation in which the kind of Cold War arms race that existed between the United States and the Soviet Union is now being mimicked on a smaller scale between India and Pakistan. Much closer to each other, much more volatile. Much closer. And there's something about the hatred between neighbors that's much more intense. I mean, we had ideological differences with the Soviet Union. We were competing for power globally. But the India-Pakistan hatred is deep. It has a long history. And with nuclear weapons that, you know, with the flight time of a missile is probably five or six minutes. And if one of those countries thinks they're under attack, the pressure to launch their own weapons quickly is enormous. And you don't want um, mistakes made in that situation. I have one last question for you, because is there, is there anything you can give us in terms of hope for a future? I don't know what that looks like. Should we try to get rid of all nuclear weapons? Can we really put that genie back in the bottle? Some of the greatest hawks of the Cold War have called for that. Henry yeah. Kissinger, George Shultz. Is there an alternative to that? Because some people just say that's naive. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I spent six years immersed in this subject, researching and writing it. And it did not leave me apocalyptic. I do not believe that we're doomed. The reason I wrote the book is I think this information is important. We need to have a national debate in this country over nuclear weapons. How many do we need? What are they for? Who are they to be aimed at? How should they be deployed on missiles or bombers or submarines? So this subject has been largely forgotten. And I really do believe that if we don't cut back the number of nuclear weapons in the world, and if the sort of arm race that's going on in South Asia continues and extends to the Middle East, the Middle East uh, a major city will at some point be destroyed by a nuclear weapon. It's not inevitable. But in a practical sense, of course, I support the abolition of nuclear weapons someday. But before that day comes, what we can do in this country is spare no expense in how we manage them, make sure the equipment's up to date, the personnel are well trained, and in, in, in an international sense, we need a global conference that brings together all the major nuclear powers. Right now, China's nuclear arsenal isn't under any kind of inspection or ver verification scheme like ours is and Russia's is. And we need to talk about reducing the number of these weapons because these are the most dangerous machines we've ever built and they go wrong. And many of them are actually not too far from the studio, according to your book. No, I, one of the biggest storage facilities in the United States is right there in the Manzano Mountains. Well, Eric, I appreciate you talking with us. Um, <laughs> Thanks for having me. You've given me a lot to have more nightmares about, but, but it's, it's also it's good it's to have also knowledge. It's also a reminder to enjoy the day. Thank you very much. Thanks.